So just a little bit about renewing the country side. I think we're on our, I don't know, 17th or 18th year, and we really work to kind of champion and help um, whether you're a person or an organization or a business that is trying to renew the countryside with innovative ideas that are both or combining kind of that triple bottom line of economics, community, and um, economics, community, and environment. So, uh, so this this fits within the sorts of things that we do. A couple of the things that we've been doing uh, recently is we're hosting a, a big national conference next week in Red Wing called the National Farm Viability Conference. Uh, we do a feast. Uh, we have the Feast Local Foods Network. Has anybody heard of the Feast Local Foods Marketplace? Okay, great. We had a couple people in the room, so we do an event uh, down in Rochester uh, with vendors from Minnesota, food makers from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa that source from uh, local uh, farmers. Some of them are farmers themselves, others of them um, products from local farmers, uh, and do a big festival this year on December 7th. Um, there's also a trade or uh, a business to business day, training day uh, with, with buyers on December 6th. Uh, we have a farmland access hub that's a partnership of, uh, of many organizations in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin, and we're hosting an Upper Midwest Farmland Summit on Monday in Red Wing. Um, we do some farm to child care work uh, both in the Twin Cities and in Greater Minnesota. And then in terms of the women programming, um, we've always, we've worked with Lisa for a really long time. Um, and uh, Soil Sisters has recently, uh, how many of you have heard of Soil Sisters? Okay, quite a few of you. It's recently become part of Reading in the Countryside, which we're really excited about. Uh, and we've also partnered with the Women Food and Ag Network, helping to put on the Caring for the Land uh, circles here in Minnesota, and we've done probably, I don't know, probably 20 to 30 of those in the last six years. Um, and then we've also done some projects. We did a project where we used, uh, had, had women partner farmers who uh, in different parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin um, and had them learn about, uh, through a contract with the Farm Service Agency, learn about kind of what programs were with the Farm Service Agency, enough that they could invite other women in their communities in um, and then introduce them to people from the Farm Service Agency because that's an agency has a history of not um, traditionally working with women to open the door. So um, that's some of the work that we do. And then these are our farm partners. Uh, and I think I've been, I think I've been like on a four of maybe three of these farms. So Susan Moftal from Squash Blossom Farm down in southeastern Minnesota, Eva Barr, Dream Acres, uh, also in southeastern Minnesota. Audrey Arner from Moonstone, who was here. I don't think, were there any of the other, any of these other women here at the conference? So no, but Audrey's talking. popping around. Yeah, Audrey was here, is here. Uh, Mary Ann from Campo de Bello, uh, Diane Webster from Border Farm Project, Heather Seacrest from Sunquist Gardens, and Stephanie Schneider from Together Farms. So and these are uh, showcased, and you'll hear, hear about more of them some from Lisa. And then, what you need to know to serve on your farm, as Lisa was saying, a safe place. And we have really a, a hidden gem in the room. We have Jane Jewett from um, the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture, um, who was part of this publication, part of the team, uh, but also is just um, one of the state's experts in terms of regulatory problems. She's, she's read the food code. <laughs> Whenever I have a question, whenever farmers have a question, she's involved in some really interesting efforts and has been kind of moving um, things forward in Minnesota to make it easier for uh, farmers and food makers to get their answers addressed and to have more clarity across the system in terms of um, regulations and licenses. So, so this is the reason that we did this, was to help farmers make good decisions uh, before investing. So. Everybody loves the idea of having a pizza. Well, most people love the idea of most of the people who like people love the idea of having a pizza farm uh, or something like that on their farm. Uh, but it, it's not as simple as you would like to think. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, so we we realized this, uh, and you know, Lisa has uh, hands-on experience, and so the idea was really to put together something. Um, 
and provided tools to do a business assessment, to ask to get people that before they jumped into something like this to really ask the questions that they needed to know, um, to share some case studies so people could see different ways that people are doing it, uh, and both what's working for them and what their struggles have been. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, to delve down deep into the, um, to the different laws, rules, and regulations that you have to follow. Um, or that you should follow if you want to be doing this about board. Uh, and then also to do a customer assessment, because that's something that we hadn't done in our previous work, was to actually um, uh, interview uh, customers who came to these onboard food services and get their reactions. So, so what um, Jan just outlined there is this toolkit, which is again the free resource. We had version one, and now we had edition two officially via this SARE project. So, what we have is, we have version one, if you'd like a paper take home copy, we realized quickly that we don't want to make too many paper copies because things keep changing. But the first section is really pretty much the same. This is the assessment part of, this is a good thing for you, how does this fit in your business plan, et cetera. The Minnesota and Wisconsin, what would you say, Jane, like 88% still there? 99? <laughs> yeah, so take, please take one because we have them printed. But, uh, Please also sign up on here and we'll send you the link and you can download the new version of Minnesota or Wisconsin. And for folks from other states, yes, you have specific state regulations, but at least a good 75% of this is very similar. It's not like night and day, it's shades of gray between states, but each state can write their own regulations when it comes to, um, to food. And then the other new elements, we'll talk about the case studies and the research are all online to download too. So if you want to um, pass that around, they'll be sure to get you the link so you've got everything fresh. And then we can keep you posted when version three comes out eventually too. Thank you. Uh, I'm Grace Brogan. I work with Jan at the Countryside and we saw many projects. Um, one quick little quiz to just kind of see where you are on this. Um, these are just a sampling of questions that you might want to keep in mind. Um, am I comfortable making decisions? Can I handle risk and situations where there is no simple yes or no answer? There might be some gray area. We heard about gray area. Um, do I have a strong network of friends and family that I can rely on for support and help, including someone to watch my children if needed if there happen to be children involved? You'll be really busy um, if you'll be hosting people on your own. Um, can I accept and even embrace failure? It, it's important to keep trying new ideas, learning and adapting. Um, some may prove more fruitful than others. So this is a way to, to explore all the different ways that this could be. It's the multiple eggs in the basket, seeing which one works for you. Um, and I don't take someone's no as the ultimate answer and always ask a lot of questions. When it comes to um, the regulatory area, there could be different perceptions and readings um, of, of um, or cultural perceptions through how that person was trained of, of what those details are. So by asking the questions, being detail oriented, being willing to be curious and, and kind of pursue what does that actually mean? Let's go all the way back to the source. Let's ask uh, some of our colleagues like Jane who can help us navigate these different interpretations to get down to the bottom of it. Being curious and willing to ask those questions can be really helpful. So checking in on a few of these things could help you determine whether or not on-farm food service um, is a good fit for you. Food product versus food service. This is a jar of pickles. I made this in my home kitchen in Wisconsin under our pickle bill, which is our cottage food law. So this is a food product. In most cases, food products are regulated through your Department of Agriculture. If I pop this open and I put it on a stick, so I can sell it to you, market. If I pop it open, I put it on a stick and I sell it to you, ready to eat food, that is food service. So I do, for example, breads in the home, my home kitchen in Wisconsin. I can sell you that loaf of bread if I start slicing it, if I put cheese on it, food service. One thing I want to touch on real quick, and we can get back to this if people are interested, it's generally called food freedom laws, and these are happening, they first happened out in Wyoming and Nevada, I thought for the life of me they would not come to the Midwest for at least another decade, surprise, uh, Illinois put one into law this past January, Minnesota just passed what's called the lemonade law, but it goes beyond lemonade, it opens up interesting opportunities for very small scale different types of food 
processing and service on your farm. So just, just hold that in the back of your mind. We can get back to that. But that's very new, very interesting, and even more confusing than existing health regulations because it's so new. Um, okay. Oopsie. I'm sorry. So when we were talking before about the reasons you might be interested in doing this, I think somebody talked about um, selling items, selling products. But most everybody answered with, the good stuff, right? I want to build community. I want to bring people on my farm. I want the kids to run barefoot. All these good things, which are fantastic. But keep that goal in mind as we move forward, because you can do that through a potluck this weekend. Same end result of bringing people on your farm and sharing. You can still sell your products. You could have a farm stand out. You could do a lot of things. People can still bring food and share food. And it's a whole lot simpler. So just as we move forward, keep it in mind and what your goals are. Because to do what we're going to be talking about, your ultimate goal needs to be make money on your farm. And uh, how can that be done most efficiently? And if you read all these materials and say, hey, this is not for me, great. We did our job <laughs> to help you navigate. But if your goals are purely focused on the community side, that is also fantastic. But think about the best way to do that. So that's a picture of our farm. We have an old hog shed and in serendipity, that's our cantina in the summer. We host tons of potlucks uh, with all sorts of things around them, but I'm not selling tickets, they're not food service. So as we move on, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, now, that said, just about every state now, including the Midwest here, has a potluck law on the books, which we could debate if that's necessary, but in Wisconsin, the health department started showing up at church funerals and sticking thermometers and grandma's meatballs, and she got pissed. So there is legislation that basically says if you legally gather voluntarily and exchange food and no money is exchanged, it's okay. The health department doesn't have to be involved. But, but it, it, there aren't even specific things within that that would be worth looking up in your state's regs. But, uh, okay, so potluck's good. Then here, and there's the printed version of this in the manual, is kind of a flowchart on if you need a license. And you can kind of take yourself through, but as you can see in big red, yes, for just about anything else other than a potluck and bringing a dish to pass and that's it, you will need a license of some sort. So what I'm gonna do is a couple quick ideas to start you thinking on the easy on-ramp before we talk about building a commercial kitchen. So partnerships, and that's exactly what you were wonderfully doing on your farm, of partnering with other entities that have the licensing, that have the commercial kitchen. So this could be with a restaurant or event planner, a chef who is basically preparing the food off-site at the commercial kitchen, whether it's theirs, whether they rent that, it really doesn't matter to you because they're doing it all legitimately. It's a low time commitment, no investment on your end, and it's a good testing opportunity to see even if you like this. And that's huge. I and mean, we write about that a lot in the toolkit to get folks thinking. You know, just because you love having your family reunion every summer and there's people around and you're feeding them, does that mean, does that translate to 100, 200 people showing up every Friday night for pizza? No, she says no. <laughs> it's, 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 but it's something to think about. And this is an easy way to do this. So dinner on the farm, Monica Walsh's operation is Minnesota-based. And that's exactly what she does with the event planning side. So she works with farms. She um, does all the coordinating with local chefs, coordinating the local food. Anything and everything that you would need to do, she does. So we um, had hosted one on our farm, it was Monica, me and my husband John, uh, for our Soul Sisters weekend a couple years ago. And her thing is, you know, I do these on farms and a farmer could be working in the field, take a shower at 2 o'clock and have a beer and enjoy their event at 3, 4, which is true. Um, and there's a small, like, usually a token payment just for some rentals or things on the farm, but it's not a money-making effort. But that said, if you want to give something, an opportunity for your, uh, your, your customers or there's something else, or you've got a need for your community, it definitely is a way, a way to do that, a way to get people on the farm and eating. Um, so yeah, that's that. There's uh, increasingly chefs and restaurants that are more familiar with how to do these. Or the whole idea of a food truck, too. Uh, the uh, bottom line is that you're not preparing the food. So a second way is for you to utilize a local commercial kitchen. So basically you, you are licensed as a caterer or whatever else would be needed to do that, and you are renting the appropriate kitchen. An appropriate kitchen is really important here because commercial kitchens are not one size fits all in a really quick nutshell. They vary based on what they are licensed to do. So uh, sometimes, increasingly, church kitchens are licensed to do more food items, 
uh, but not necessarily. So it's something to definitely ask. Um, but that said, uh, one of our farm partners, uh, the, the Bellazinis, Marianne and Mark at Campo de Bella in Mount Horeb, they have, okay, not have, they had a CSA, and I'll get back to that. Um, uh, they, they had a CSA, a vegetable CSA, had moved to kind of south of Madison, but they loved the hosting idea, they're Italian, they wanted to do more of this, what could we do? So they smartly rented out, in this case, their parish kitchen, and did these off-site farm-to-table dinners with their CSA base, again, no investment. Now here they retained their earnings, they went through some more licensing that they could charge for it, and they were making the money coming in versus working with the event planner, and it's bottom line a good testing opportunity because they are not going into debt over it. Now, there are people like the Bellazinis who said, hey, this is, we love this, this is great, this is our calling. So, flash forward five years, they built an, it's basically, as we called it in this project, this is the Cadillac of on-farm kitchens. This is basically a restaurant on their farm. They call it a cafe. Um, Campo de Bella, they have a full kitchen, they do small plates, they do a lot of catered events. And they mentioned they're Italian, let's have a winery there too, so they do some small batch brewing. Um, they uh, are, are figuring out as they go, and one thing I want to just give a plug for the, the Bellazinis and all of the farm partners in this SARE project, and just in SARE in general, is that collaborative spirit of farms. I mean, this doesn't make any business sense, right? Why would you invite people who are basically going to start the same thing you did and learn the hard way, and share all that you learned and give tips and advice on doing it differently, because that's what we do, right? And we all realize that the more of these operations, I mean, the Bellazzini's goal is to have Southern Wisconsin like the Napa of farm to table, <laughs> agritourism restaurants. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So, um, but this costs 200 grand. It's their baby. They're gonna do this for the rest of their lives to just pay that off at minimum, you know? So it's a big leap, but it was a smart, a very smart way to do it. And all the farms I'm talking about here are full case studies in the, the manual that you can read. Um, except for Dorothy's range, but I wanted to just mention this. April Prusia is a local farmer by me, who uh, was actually a speaker at one of our, our field days. Uh, same kind of process, though. She, anyway, she's at the conference. She did the meat intensive. She's all about hogs, heritage hogs, and getting more people eating real pork, etc. But she was finding that people didn't really know what real pork tasted like, and this need to do more of the on-farm food service. So in her case, she got a catering license. She rents out the small local cafe in her small town in the evenings, and has done some catered events like this. She has a large barn, uh, but again, fully licensed, etc. Now, one thing that often happens, because this is such a new, still relatively new and hot idea, is you start putting your feelers out there, and things go in ways that you might not have predicted. So, uh, April's in my local group, and we have, as mentioned, this Soul Sisters weekend in August, and this was three years ago when she was literally going to do her first event. Like, I had talked to her a year before, saying, hey, we really need a farm-to-table event around this weekend. You were talking about getting your catering license. What do you think about doing it a year from now? And it was November. You know, she said, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds like a good goal. So everything got crazy into July and August, getting ready for this event. I don't know, she's probably cursing my name somewhere in there, but then she really cursed my name 48 hours before her first event when I got this call saying, oh yeah, Modern Farmer's coming, and they want to shoot your event. Like, literally, the whole thing. And she did it brilliantly and with grace and gin, I believe, but afterwards. Um, but, but these things happen, so you just got to be prepared for the unexpected. And I want to give a plug, uh, in this, I do a lot of just food and farm writing, this month's October issue of Hobby Farms has a feature on April where she talks about these things too from a, um, a business perspective. So she calls the shots. She does the events when she wants to do them, and it's just a, a handful a year and some little private events. Okay, so moving on to on-farm meals. So these are the regular meals that would require a commercial kitchen on-site, period. Hold that thought, because I want to quickly talk about the pizza farms, because that just is what is the thing, right? And there are reasons people do pizza farms, as we just talk about. Because they, I, don't, I don't want to use the word easier, because that would send us down the wrong path. But it is more specific a food item, and you're not changing your menu, and that's what is huge. So, uh, and it's interesting, when we started this project, there was an article, it was probably about five years ago now, in USA Today, about this hot trend of pizza farms in the Midwest. And at the time, there were five, three in Minnesota, two in Wisconsin. 
Now I lost count. I mean, there's well over 15 to 20. But hold that thought. We'll talk about it at the end of some of the case study stories. What we need to be thinking about is what is the next pizza farm? I don't know if this is saturated, but there's a whole lot of them. But there's still people who want to come out and eat on your farm. What's, who's talking about, oh, your sausage, it's exactly where you want to go. Well, no, no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not so much like that. It, it's, you're going to be local where you are, and you'll hear some stories of what different people are doing, but that's exactly what we need to be thinking. Okay, pizza farms typically only do pizza. That's really important because when you, and this is the stuff to process through before you call the health department, you um, uh, need to know what you're making. So please, don't call the health department and say, I don't know what I'm making. I don't know what's right next week, or da 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 It doesn't fit the checkbox. Pizza fits the checkbox. It's hot. It comes out of a 900 degree oven. Yeah, you can change the toppings, but they get what it is. It's typically served takeout style, right? So there's not a restaurant attached to it with other things. And most states have some sort of limitation on the number of these types of events you could do. Typically under 20-ish, which nicely correlates with a night or two a weekend, or, you know, of course. So Stony Acres, um, one of our partners, uh, they're in this situation where they're, the pizza nights are making more money than the CSA, and what does that mean, and what are all the complications around that? All right, so real quick, the commercial kitchen setup for a pizza farm, when Kat Becker did this at the time, and you see some pictures there. This is not a big deal. This is not very pretty. You know, it's pretty basic. She did it for under five grand, scouting used equipment for a year. They had another renovation projects going on that they could tie this into, so there were cost savings. So that's like, I'm giving you the real low, low, low bar. And it took a lot of time to get there. But again, that's all they're doing there. They're making dough, they're making sauce, um, etc. Now, that said, they are also really neat. And here's where that we were talking, Grace was talking about, are you comfortable with the gray zone? And more so, are you comfortable asking questions? Her health inspector at the time was saying, hey, you need a, I think it was $15,000 range hood, just like McDonald's has, right? Because you're cooking meat. And she's like, wait a minute, I don't want to spend $15, $15, $15, $15,000 on that. Uh, the person coming in to do the inspection is not empowered to say, oh, I realize you're only using that one hour for 20 weeks, you know, that's okay. So you need to find out who in the chain of command makes those decisions and get an exemption, in this case from the higher up in the state, then the local person has that piece of paper. Oh, okay, we understand. So I mean, there are, there are reasonable people, but you need to ask those questions. Um, very labor intensive and very weather dependent on pizza farms. So it's a lot of people that need to come together to make this happen. Now, that depends on your scale, and you'll see some of that in the case studies, but if you're open and whoever shows up, also very weather dependent. When it rains, people don't want to come with their five-year-old cute daughter, as good as she is, you know, to be in the rain for pizza. Uh, so a lot of variables there. Okay, so um, research, research uh, conducted over this last year about um, what's happening with on-farm food service. So we could get a sense of what is the customer experience like? What is working? What do people want? A little bit of uh, market analysis out there. Um, as far as we know, this is the first time such data has been collected. Uh, so it's a first step. Hopefully we can keep collecting more as this continues to grow. Um, and a shout out to Elena Carroll with UW Stout, uh, a graduate student who uh, helped us with this research project, which was at seven farms um, surveyed throughout the summer of 2018, reaching 151 participants. So 151 visitors to these seven farms, trying to get a sense of what their experience was like, what they were looking for upon visiting the farm, what their experience was at the farm. Um, so a couple of highlights for you. Um, we like this number right up here. 100% of customers enjoyed their overall experience. People are excited to be out there and they're having a great time. It's not that often that you get 100% customer satisfaction. Um, so that's, there's a desire and there's a need and there's a market opportunity there. Um, we had 68% of folks uh, heard about the events word of mouth. So keeping that in mind, who's having these conversations with community, who's asking who. Um, paid advertising was 18%, social media 16%. How are you communicating with your existing markets? 
how would you like to, to spread that word? And keep in mind that word of mouth in your community for those who might be visiting um, is a big one. Um, who are the customers? 50% of the customers uh, in this uh, research um, were families, families with children. 25% uh, were groups of friends. Groups of friends and families constituted really two, two big groups of people who were coming out. Someone who's looking for family-friendly activities or something to do on an evening with their group of friends. Um, so those are two things to keep in mind when you're looking um, at your, your potential business models. 22% um, were customers, uh, of the customers were couples going on a date. Um, so kind of continuing to, to think about what, what are the, these customers looking for when they're coming to visit. Um, let's see, what else are some highlights I'd like to share? Um, I can go to the next page here. Um, I like the, the top five reasons people visited, I think it's helpful. Um, well, number one was, or one of these uh, was pizza. Uh, people are excited about pizza. Um, they come for the delicious pizza and the dessert pizza too. So thinking about the diversification within your pizza offerings. Um, another priority for a lot of people is quality or, and organic ingredients. Sure, they're excited to come out and visit the farm, if they're considering doing that as part of the meal, there is an interest in what is going into the meal. That's great to know for your customers who are coming on your farm and for potential customers for your other uh, market endeavors, whether they're CSA, potential CSA customers or what have you, they're caring about what's in their ingredients. Um, family and family friendly and gathering with friends are two things that come up in those top five reasons people are coming. Um, so we see that both in top five reasons people are visiting, as well as who are the customers that are coming, how are they identifying themselves. Um, and the on-the-farm outdoor experience, that connecting with the place in this really special way that a lot of people don't get to do. Um, we can share this with you um, if, when you're signing up on the spreadsheet for, for more data. A nice, um, you can't read them here, but 98%, 99% of customers um, satisfied with the customer service and the quality of food. Really good high numbers there to keep in mind. But also knowing that customers are um, keeping those things in mind. Um, you will be juggling a lot of roles if you're doing this. Customer service is one of them. Um, so people are paying attention to that. Um, this is you know, a number of the things that we learned through this research project. Again, we can share more there. but really interesting information to just kind of help guide you when you're thinking about what the market wants and, and what's happening right now. So one thing too, um, when Grace was talking about the research of folks and the family experience, is families are coming though wanting a farm experience and how do you do that when all of your staff is making pizzas? And it's, it's been a real challenge for a lot of the farms and some have done things through signage like self-guided tours, they want to have the whole thing and take a selfie with the goats. And how can you facilitate that? Or is it worth having another staff to help with that, etc.? cetera? It's, it's kind of hard to decide. Yeah. All right, a couple of the farm partner stories. So Three Acres, Ava Barr, I want to stick this on here because the women involved with these businesses are just amazing creative women who have these multiple layers of lives and talents and things. And for them, and perhaps yourself, it culminates in this business. So Ava is like a amazing actress on her own right. She founded Looking Glass Theater in Chicago. She's bouncing back and forth, but as you see on the left, she also has this farming side to her. And not just farming, but lives, um, lives off grid. So their place, their husband Todd, Dream Acres, very different than a lot of the other pizza farms in that, yeah, A, it's off grid. They're the first licensed commercial kitchen that doesn't plug into the outlet wall. Try explaining that to the health department. And kudos to them and kudos to all of these farms who have done this already because each and every one of them has had their set of challenges and has really pioneered it for things to come because this one in particular, it's like, what do you mean you're, clo you're shutting your entire refrigerator down? Well, we don't need it until next Friday. And those things take time, they take patience, they take explanation, but kudos to them. So theirs is much smaller. They cap at about 80 pizzas a night. Uh, they are vegetarian, they're vegetarian themselves. They have uh, vegetarian pizzas. They have some kind of vegetarian sausage, but Ava's first to say, you know, I probably lose people who want the sausage on their pizza, but this is who we are, and this is what we do. So it's very much value-driven, 
And as you saw with her theatrical background, she also has a nonprofit on the farm uh, for rural arts. So there's a lot of that just creative vibe going on there. Her, her son uh, delivers the pizzas on stilts, you know, that sort of thing. And that's what they do. And, and they keep it to a scale that's manageable. And I wanted to start off with this because uh, it's important to think about. Because just because people want to come to your farm doesn't mean you have to take everybody. Or things have to grow to such a scale, what would make sense for you? Uh, and, um, and they also, part of the reason they did this, and it's interesting when you hear the stories, is there might be multiple things that prompt you to get commercial in the kitchen capacity. They also had a, um, through the nonprofit, a summer camp. And even though it is a nonprofit, increasingly camps are getting commercial kitchens too. So it all made sense to kind of do it at once. So another person who is an artist and also um, always wanted to live on a farm, a diversified farm. And so I just don't know what she did prior to farming, but I know that her husband, who works in the architecture world, um, this was just always a dream. And so finally, they just decided that at 50, at 50, <laughs> to jump off and do this. So they bought a farm <coughs> in Orinoco, um, which uh, is lovely. It's got she's got all sorts of geese and ducks and chickens and a couple of uh, Highland cattle. Um, but she too wanted to do food service on, on the farm. So they were selling at farmers market, uh, and then they started doing some. Um, research into what it would take to actually do this legally uh, and realized it was going to take a lot. Uh, so they actually ended up doing a Kickstarter uh, and raised $25,000 to build the commercial kitchen on their farm and put in, in the pizza oven. Um, and so they've been doing dinners and I don't remember how many, they do pizza, they just do pizza. And they, uh, they also do bread, they take, take, yeah, they take to the farmer's market and they, they sell at other places too. Um, and then they do a ton of events. Her husband is also a, a musician, so they have music on the farm with their pizza. Uh, and I think she says that she can one or two weddings a year. The weddings are, yeah, that's, that's a whole other beast. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, I remember when we did the field day out there, I remember her husband, Roger, um, almost. Yeah, kind of choked up because I think part of what made their business model possible was that his mom passed away within this process and left them some funding and that was some, you know, they had an uh, inheritance that they were able to basically put into the farm to do this. So it can be a really expensive endeavor and so I think, you know, I think there's, there's so much excitement about doing this. But there's also like the business reality of doing it. And you really have to figure out, you know, it's the old, like how do you make a million dollars farming you start with two <laughs> So it can be done, but you really have to, you know, be business savvy and don't go into it, you know, thinking, you know, that everybody's gonna come, that I mean, there is a lot to do around it. In the, the full data, it, it tracks mileage. It's generally about an hour. Okay. People drive about an hour. So okay. several of the ones, like Dream Makers in Wyckoff, is drivable-ish from the cities, mm -hmm. Rochester area. However, some of them, like Suncrest Gardens, in kind of central middle of nowhere Wisconsin, is central middle of nowhere Wisconsin. So yeah, that general metro area is a good draw if you've got it. Um, an interesting one, uh, Borner Farm Project, is in Hudson, mm -hmm. so right over the border. It's a, it was originally a farm and has a lot of land, almost like a park in the middle of town. And the folks running it um, who are uh, involved with our, our case study, I mean, wonderful people, very committed to community and all of that, have been haggling all summer long with their city because now it's growing too big and it's in the city. Do you know? So you've got, they're getting the people, but then the city didn't want them. So it's, it's a constant kind of thing. So the food code, the, the federal food code is, um, is written by the Food and Drug Administration and it comes out of the Pure Food and Drug Act, like back in the 1930s. And um, states adopt it and can add to it because they can't take away from it. So uh, in Minnesota, the food code is part of Minnesota rules. There are statutes which are laws passed by the 
legislature, and then there are rules, which are interpretations of statute. And so the Minnesota Food Code is based on that FDA um, food code, but adopted by Minnesota. 